Hi, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHUS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you very much for tuning into my show this morning. We are going to be talking about Baltimore on the show today. So recently in Ferguson, there were riots that occurred, and also this occurred in Baltimore to a much greater extent. And uh, it seems like there's a very similar trigger cause that occurred in both of these situations. So in Ferguson, a uh, young black man was killed by the police, shot dead. In Baltimore, there was a young black man who was tossed around in the back of a police truck and uh, and ended up with a severed spine and all sorts of uh, fatal injuries from that ride. Now, we libertarians are very conscious of police brutality. We recognize that when the police initiate aggression, especially against peaceful people, but also in other circumstances where that aggression is not justified or constituted given the circumstance, then we would say that that is an initiation of violence and is aggression and is not valid. It is, it is not legitimate or moral to initiate force against people who have done no harm. And in the same way, because we adhere to private property and the non-initiation of violence, the non-aggression principle where no one may initiate force or violence against people who have not uh, initiated that violence first, so only in self-defense may you use violence, uh, the protesters, the rioters are also in the wrong for walking into people's uh, houses and businesses and stealing whatever they want and burning buildings down and, you know, torching cars and destroying property, none of that is valid in any way, shape, or form. Now, I understand that the protesters are very upset. I'm upset about it. Uh, There's a recent report that was released. Uh, The Guardian did some investigation and found that between 2003 and 2009, the police in the U.S. killed an average of 928 people per year. Now, I've heard recent uh, statistics that it's been about 400 in 2015 so far. That averages out to about three deaths a day. Three deaths a day by police. So I certainly don't want to downplay the anger that people are feeling at the injustice that they have endured. Um, But I also want to have people realize that Even though you're angry, that doesn't mean that you can take your anger out on innocent parties. If they're angry at the police, they need to let the police know. They don't go to a third party who has nothing to do with the police and go and attack them. Because then it becomes a self-interested and a selfish kind of motivation. You're not actually sticking up for the people who have been harmed by the police. You're just going out and stealing for your own self-gain and destroying just for the sake of destroying. It's not actually accomplishing what your goal is, is to show the injustice of the situation that you've been involved in. So I often use this example when I'm talking about this. You know, imagine that you're in a bus station and you're just sitting around minding your own business, reading a newspaper, and all of a sudden some guy comes up and whacks you right in the face. And you fall to the ground and then you get up, you shake your head and and you stand up and you find some random innocent person who was standing next to you and you hit them. That's not real justice, right? Because uh, there was one party who initiated violence against you. He hit you, and then you take uh, take your anger and you send it towards another person who had nothing to do with that. He did not initiate violence against you. He did not harm you. He did not uh, hit you in the face. He didn't do any of that stuff, and yet he is the one that is feeling the wrath of your anger. And so justice truly means a recompensation and an apology from the person who harmed to the person who was harmed. So in the situation where somebody hit me in the face, um, they owe me an apology. They owe me uh, maybe some medical bills if uh, anything on my face was damaged, uh, the doctor to check me out, the ambulance to take me to the hospital. They owe me all of that because if they hadn't come along and hit me, then I would have been whole. And in the same way, if the police did not initiate violence against uh, peaceful people, then those people would have been whole. And so we have to look at this in the same way. 
So I want to turn now to Jeffrey Tucker, who's going to talk a little bit about Baltimore, a legacy of failed state experiments, and some of the reasons why the people in Baltimore have every right to be angry. If you have seen The Wire, you know the score. There are consequences to state management of any social order. Baltimore is a paradigmatic case. How long can people continue to evade the obvious lessons? It began more than a hundred years ago with the imposition of state segregation. This was the original sin that created a second class of citizenship in racial ghettos for the first time since the end of the Civil War. Every policy response follows from there, with one coercive mistake following another. This town became the backyard playground for the ruling class planners in Washington, D.C. The intellectuals and lawmakers behind these policies cannot reasonably claim to escape responsibility. Baltimore blew up in riots and fires in the days following the astonishingly cruel death of Freddie Gray and the stonewalling of the police department about how and why he was killed. But it is a mistake to focus the blame on this incident alone. What happened in Baltimore is the product of the drug war, a racially punitive policing system, failed public services, segregated public housing, urban renewal, endless rounds of progressive education reform, a highly regulated labor market that cuts off economic opportunity, occupational licensure, gun control, and permanent martial law that makes everyone feel like prisoners. Baltimore got the full brunt of it all, at every stage, decade after decade. What do all these policies have in common? They represent the fatal error, common for the better part of a century, of believing that policy elites can manage the social order better than the social order can manage itself. Only the ruling class can decide where and how people should live, how they will be educated, what they can buy and sell, the terms of labor contracts, what businesses come and go, and who gets to enter into a certain occupations, and the terms under which they may do so. The government would do it all, build and maintain the housing, provide the education, make the jobs, set the pay, enable the security, and administer the justice. How has this turned out? The results are in. During the riots, there were no dire consequences that were not observable all over the media. Social alienation, racial conflict, a war between elites and the people, a loss of respect for property rights, moral desperation, and a profound loss of hope. That invariably comes with the loss of freedom. How it expresses itself can be unpredictable, confusing, and chaotic, but that bad ideas have bad consequences no one can doubt. This is why the typical bourgeois response to the events in Baltimore is so wrong. People look only at the surface and shake their fists. They say, lock up these thugs, impose martial law, unleash the cops. These solutions sell well to a frightened public. But this is how fascism wins. It lives off the failure of socialism, and then we circle back around again without end. What is wrong with the police state solution? Notice how good the cops are at roughing people up when there is little danger and no real threat. But when the time comes when people actually hope that the police will defend person and property against invasion, times of genuine upheaval and fear, suddenly the police retire back behind their ramparts and lob smoke grenades into the crowd. It happens in every case of civil unrest, and it's always astonishing. This is when property owners discover that they are on their own, but they are unprepared for the onslaught, so they welcome ever more mighty police forces, only to find out later that martial law makes them prisoners in their own city, and still does not bring the peace that everyone wants. The persistence of this behavior should make everyone rethink their presumptions that aggressive, tax-funded, government-run policing is the right approach to security. Escalation will work no better in Baltimore than it did in Baghdad. More force is simply not the cure for all social ills. That goes for drug policy, education policy, family policy, and labor markets.
This is not about the failure of one mayor, one police force, or one president. It's about the failure of an unworkable paradigm of social and economic management. How many other cities will burn before we admit it? How much longer must we endure pious lectures by left-wing intellectual elites about how we haven't done enough, as well as the angry brown-shirted bromides by right-wing pundits about how recalcitrants need more iron-fisted blows to the head? We are witnessing the terrible costs of a failed worldview that resulted in many failed states. What remains to us is the option to try what we should have done long ago permit people to work out their problems for themselves, unmolested and unimpeded in the exercise of their human rights. They can and will take care of themselves. That article was by Jeffrey A. Tucker. It was posted on the Foundation for Economic Education, FEE.org, and it's called Baltimore, A Legacy of Failed State Experiments. Expanding on this, um, The Bionic Mosquito is a really great blog online. Um, you can find it at bionicmosquito.blogspot.com. And uh, he's going to write an article called Blowback, where he ties in the foreign policy and the failed attempts to use force to subdue other nations uh, to what Baltimore is going through. And he's going to talk about the right and the left and how they're both contributing to Baltimore's problems. Baltimore burns, the current and most recent example of violent reaction to perceived injustice. It is not necessary that there is truth or guilt behind the perception in any one particular instance. It is sufficient that there is truth or guilt behind the perceived injustices often enough. This is sufficient to create the perception. There is nothing right, moral, or just about indiscriminate looting and violence. Let nothing I write here suggest otherwise. Yet the fall into such violence is understandable. It is a predictable reaction, blowback, to the policies of the right on the one hand and the left on the other. In the case of the right, the connection is more obvious as it takes little intellectual capacity to connect the dots. The reaction immediately follows the action. In the case of the left, an elementary understanding of economics, incentives, and logic is required. Far too much to expect from most, it seems. The right. Police can kill with immunity. No statement so broad can be always true, yet it is true often enough. Wearing the badge offers immunity to the gun bearer. There are examples of this almost every day, it seems, yet only a few such incidents draw national attention. And even here, usually only after, video evidence in contradiction to the party line is revealed. Protect the shield, protect the blue line. It isn't only within the police department. What of the prosecutors? What of the judges? What of the law? All stand silent, at least when not contributing to the cover-up. No justice, no peace. Administrative leave or a quiet retirement with full pension. If punishment is ever meted out, it is such as this. Not bad work if you can get it. Occasionally, a community will react, see Baltimore. It isn't to condone, only to understand blowback. There was a statement by one woman, one with very poor command of the English language, so poor that one might instantly put her in the category of an uneducated cretin. Yet her words were golden. The most die-hard libertarian, too small a minority, or morally consistent Christian, an even smaller one, would have no trouble agreeing with the justness of her sentiment, which means that she will be ignored by almost everyone. I paraphrase her statement. Quote, the police should be under the same law as the rest of us. A nation of laws, not men. What could this mean other than what this insightfully intelligent woman offered? There was a time when this was true, in the supposedly horrible dark days of the Middle Ages, when the law was above all, when even the king was below the law with only the duty to uphold the law, nothing more. The right only offers sentiments such as, obey orders and you won't get hurt. If you don't do anything wrong, you have nothing to fear. 
Of course, even these admonitions aren't true. What of the SWAT team breaking down the wrong door? What of throwing a grenade into a baby's crib? Collateral damage. Cause enough collateral damage, and you will get blowback. Yet what if the world you live in is one where those you are told to obey often kill with immunity? What if you have seen this often enough? What if you heard enough stories to make this perception your reality? In what kind of world is death the penalty for disobeying the one by whom you feel threatened? It is true in the criminal world. It was equally true in Stalin's world. This is what the right offers. I have no idea if death at the hands of the immune is true more often in lower-class black communities than in other communities. However, I suspect if this happened as often in upper-middle-class white communities, we would have heard about it. I suspect something would even have been done about it by now. The Left Robert Wenzel refers to them as LBJ's grandkids, those multiple generations who have grown up since the mid-60s without fathers, without role models, without jobs, without hope, without incentive to improve. Fruits of the loins of LBJ's great society. Income guaranteed for proof of feminine fertility and masculine virility, without the need for responsibility. On top of this, little chance for legal, introductory employment due to minimum wage requirements. When legal employment is out of reach, other opportunities are secured. Peddling drugs is one such option. Drug laws have overly impacted or have been overly enforced against minority communities, further removing the father figures from their responsibilities. Victimless crimes resulting in incarceration rates higher than anywhere else on earth. LBJ isn't alone with his bone offered to the left in order to have a free hand in prosecuting the genocide of millions of Vietnamese. There is no shortage of voices calling for compassion for those who have had hard times poured down upon their heads. Compassion with your money, not theirs. Compassion with your money, whether you want to contribute or not. Compassion poured down to the point of ensuring the drowning of those being compassioned upon. Life without consequence or responsibility. One generation after another with this life offered as the model. Always another lost generation. The idea of respect for property and life is lost on those who are able to obtain property and life with no effort necessary, with pay raises offered for promiscuity. Property without effort results in no respect for property. Life without effort results in no respect for life. 2 plus 2 equals 4. No respect for property or life results in looting and death. Don't point to individual cases of the small handful that have found a way to break out of this hell that the left has created for them. There are always exceptions to expected outcomes for every incentive system. However, incentives have a way of achieving, far more often than not, that which they incentivize. Blowback The right demands compliance and order. Hence, police are free to kill with immunity. The left demands compassion with your money. Hence, generations grow without any comprehension of the idea of respect for property and life. No knowledge of how to productively contribute to society. There is nothing surprising about Baltimore. Blowback. Actions have consequences. That article was by, by Bionic Mosquito. You can find him at bionicmosquito.blogspot.com. And that article is called Blowback. So I want to pause here for just a moment and reflect on the fact that, that both of the authors offered uh, government in interventions into the economy as causes of these catastrophic and destructive results of rioting and looting and all these people going crazy. So it's not just the police. There's all these interventions in the economy that make it more difficult for people to find jobs, to be productive, to uh, have a normal family structure. 
um, uh, Jeffrey Tucker mentioned The Wire, which is an excellent show. And in season four, they go into the education system and they talk about um, children growing up in these kind of ghetto and, and uh, you know, poverty stricken environments and how their family is so lacking from their lives. Uh, in the entire season of the show, I only saw one parental unit who was actually interested and involved in that in a child's life. And it was actually a child that he just kind of adopted off the street who was living homeless. And he said, hey, come live with me. You know, the guy was a crackhead. He was a person who was just on the street selling stuff so that he could get some drugs trying to get off drugs. He was trying to make good choices for his life. But this was the only positive parental unit that I saw in the entire show. He would show up to school and he would bring, he would bring the child there and, and sit down with the principal and try and talk to them and things like that. This was the only parent who was actually involved in a child's life. And this happens a lot in these, uh, in these inner cities. And a lot of it is because of welfare, because the state tries to bail people out from their irresponsible decisions in choosing partners and choosing uh, people to have in their life and, and income coming in th through a stable marriage. Instead of being in a stable marriage, the government comes in as the father figure to bail out people's choices. And it's very important to look at the long-term consequences of government intervention and not just look at the, the police beating people up. There are a lot of other problems that are involved where people can't sustain themselves and simply don't know about how to produce and give value to other people in society. So what can be done? Well, the answer is the market. We just allow the market to work. We get the government out of the way. People buy, people sell, people trade, people enter into the workforce. Uh, they might enter in at a lower wage rate than we might think is, is best for them. But what they're going to do is they're going to create value and they're going to bring value to their own employment and they're going to rise the ranks and they're going to learn how to be productive and become more and more productive as they get and acquire more skills. And so Jason Kuznicki is going to call, uh, talk about this a little bit in his article called Baltimore and the Rights of the Poor. Well, there goes our trip to Baltimore. We'd been hoping to see the annual kinetic sculpture race, but I see that it's been postponed indefinitely. If you're inclined, now is your chance to laugh. Get it out early. Here's a problem in describing how cities work. Any example I might pick to symbolize the decay of Baltimore can always be ridiculed. Weep, weep, my friends, for that lousy corporate CVS, the one that nobody really liked, anyway. See how easy that was? The one direct effect I have experienced from the recent riots is that I and my daughter will possibly not be seeing a giant pink defetta poodle peddled down the streets of Baltimore by a bunch of probably inebriated art students. I'm unlikely to suffer any of the riot's more troubling effects, like having to walk an extra half mile to get my asthma medication, or like getting my t car torched. And yes, leading with the pink to fade a poodle might just be the definition of white privilege, but at least, you know, I'm aware of it. Cities are hard to explain. They're made up of millions of tiny little things, and of the networks of trust and expectation that exist among them. Any one of these things, a CVS, a giant pink to fade a poodle, a population of inebriated art students, does not make a city. Almost any one of them can be laughed at or just dismissed as trivial in isolation. But good functional cities are networks. They're not isolated nodes. A city isn't the big to fade a poodle, but it might be the expectation that there will be something fun and free to do in the streets on some warm spring afternoon, for which we can thank the art students. And other expectations, too. After we see the giant pink to fade a poodle, and when my daughter gets stung by a bee, there's the CVS, and after that, when we decide we want dinner, we have several choices at hand. If we want a room for the night, there it is. And if we want to relocate to Baltimore, we might just be able to find decent housing and jobs. I think we can all agree that is what a city should look like. But how does it come into being? I suspect that some significant trust has to be there first. 
Without it, few will venture to try new things. Restaurants won't open. Parades won't be held. Families won't move in. Few will try adding new threads to the network. And when the old threads wear out, they will not be replaced. For a very long time, the networks of trust and expectation in the city of Baltimore have been fraying. But it's not because of the rioting, which is only a symptom, if an advanced one, of an underlying condition. The well-documented culture of police brutality in Baltimore has meant that one of the bigger threads in the network, the ability to turn to police when you or your property is threatened, cannot be depended on. And when that thread goes, so go many others. It's long been known in Baltimore that the police can't be counted on to perform their core functions, particularly in the poorer neighborhoods. In such places, the police either can't or won't reliably protect persons and property from attack, not without levels of collateral damage that any reasonable person would deplore. And when you don't have security, you can forget all about community. That's part of why, paradoxically, the poor need property rights even more than the rich. What the poor possess is definitionally small. As a result, it's all too easy to take everything that they have, including their sense of dignity, including their ability to trust, and finally including their sense of community, which has to start with the understanding that community leaders and enforcers aren't just out to squeeze them for cash that the leaders and enforcers don't see them merely as yet another home to be searched, another gun to seize, another dog to shoot, and another marijuana conviction waiting to happen. The poor need security not just in their own property, but also in that of others, and these others aren't necessarily poor. It's a good thing whenever the owner of a grocery store franchise feels confident enough to get started in a neighborhood that maybe wasn't so well off and that maybe lacked good choices beforehand. But that won't happen without a measure of trust, and when the community has good reason not to trust well, outsiders probably won't trust either. Contrast all this to the property rights of the rich. Paradoxically, the rich often barely need formal protections of their rights at all. Their property just isn't threatened all that much, whether by the police or by anyone else. And when the property rights of the rich do get threatened, the rich can fight back. Definitionally, they have many more resources at hand, including non-financial ones. The rich have political influence, private security choices, and just moving. The would-be owner of a grocery store franchise isn't compelled to open in any particular neighborhood or even to go into business at all his money can always sit safely in a bank. The rich also aren't living so precariously. Even if all else fails and if a rich person's car does get torched, he can just buy another car. Yes, that's bad, but it's not going to ruin him. The same can't necessarily be said of a poor person, for whom a car might be her single most valuable possession. So, while I'm complaining about the loss of a silly but fun kinetic sculpture race, let's all remember just who depends most on the networks of trust and expectation that can either live or die in our cities. Let's also remember that those networks depend on protecting the all-too-fragile property rights of the poor. That article was by Jason Kuznicki, and it was posted on the Foundation for Ec Economic Education, FEE.org, and it was called Baltimore and the Rights of the Poor. So I hope that you enjoyed this. This has been an episode of the Austrian Circle. We'll be back next week for another episode, Tuesdays at 1030 in the morning. Have a great week. Take care.